Hey, what's up guys? Brian Kelly here from Zombie Guitar. Here in today's video, I want to talk about three things that I would consider to be almost conspiracy theories. The reason I call these conspiracy theories is because these are things that are taught in the guitar and music theory community, and they're taught to millions of people, and they're just generally accepted as truth. But the problem is they're not true. They're not right. And this isn't my opinion. This isn't about like, I'm better than people or whatever. I'm not the best guitar player in the world. I'm a mediocre guitar player. I'm just a guy that looks at the stuff that's being taught in the music theory world, and if it's not right because the math doesn't add up, I'm going to say that's not right because the math doesn't add up. It would be like if everyone's telling me that 2 plus 2 equals 8, well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do the math, and I'm going to say, no, 2 plus 2 equals 4. I don't know where you guys are getting this 8 thing from. It just does not make sense. Conspiracy theory number one, minor keys. Minor keys do not exist. What exists is keys. That's all. We have keys, and there's 12 of them. You can even say that there's 15 keys if you consider enharmonic equivalents. And I made a very, very detailed video about all of this about three weeks ago. It's called The Fundamental Misunderstanding in Music Theory. It debunks the fact that there are 24 keys. There are not 24 keys. The math will not allow that to work. It just will not. I totally understand that we use the terms major key and minor key to communicate with each other. I do it, you do it, we all do it, that's fine. But from a theoretical standpoint, when you actually go to study music theory, which is what I teach, which is what I take very seriously, and I wanna make sure that my information is correct, you're gonna to come to find that there is no such thing as a minor key. It is nothing other than just a mode of the major scale. So in any given key, there's exactly seven notes. In order to determine what those seven notes are for any given key, you have to start on any one of the 12 possible starting notes and then play the major scale. We have exactly 12 notes to start on. Any one of those 12 notes could be the starting point. From that starting point, you play the major scale. The major scale is the Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do scale. That's how you get your seven in key notes for any of the 12 possible keys. So we have 12 possible starting points because we have 12 notes in total for which we could start on. And then we have one scale, which is the scale that is used to determine what the seven in key notes are. That's the major scale. So 12 possible starting points times one default scale equals 12 possible keys. So that's the math behind how many keys there are. There are a total of 12 keys, and you can even extend that to 15 keys if you are considering these enharmonic equivalents. So doing what I do for a living, which is teaching music theory online, I've been in my fair share of arguments before. Now, the most common argument that people will present to me that, that where they're trying to prove this 24 or 30 key model is the functional harmony argument. So what functional harmony is, is a general set of guidelines to follow that attempt to explain how chords move from one chord to another chord to another chord. And the way that this is done is by classifying every single chord as either a dominant type of chord, a subdominant type of chord, or a tonic type of chord. Subdominants tend to move to dominant chords, dominant chords tend to move to tonic chords. So in functional harmony, a tonic chord, a chord that has been assigned the label as being a tonic chord, is the key. So since we have a total of 12 major chords, or 15 if you're considering enharmonic equivalents, and we have a total of 12 minor chords, or 15 if you're considering enharmonic equivalents, then we have a total of 24 to 30 individual chords, each of which could be labeled as the tonic. Now, under this rule set of functional harmony, the tonic chord is what they're considering to be the key. Therefore, since there are a total of 24 to 30 possible chords, each of which could be labeled as the tonic, there are a total of 24 to 30 possible keys. So that is the only way that you can make this work. That is the only way that you could possibly come up with 24 or 30 keys. You have to understand that key does not equal key signature, and key instead equals single chord. So conspiracy theory number two is the cage system. Now the cage system is a great system. I love it, highly advocate it, I teach it. The cage system is about chords, soloing over chord changes, chord tone targeting, arpeggios, playing to the changes, anything like that. Guitar players, they all start out the same way. We all start out by wanting to connect the scale patterns together. Why do we do that? It's because the guitar is just complicated. If we wanted to map out all of the notes of the C major scale across the guitar fretboard, it would look like this. That's kind of complicated. If you wanted to do the exact same thing on the piano and map out all of the notes of the C major scale on a piano, it just looks like this. It's just the white keys. Super easy. 
But back to the guitar again, the cool thing about the guitar is once you learn this big complicated pattern, this is known as the diatonic scale, once you learn this big complicated pattern, the pattern remains the same for all 12 keys. So you only have to learn this big complicated pattern one single time. In order to do that, we need to break it down into smaller patterns. And this is what guitar theory is about. Guitar theory is about breaking the fretboard up into patterns such that you don't actually have to know the note names on the fretboard. You just have to memorize patterns. That's what guitar theory is for. So one very popular way of breaking up this big giant pattern into smaller patterns is what is known as the five pattern approach. Now you can assign arbitrary labels to these patterns. It doesn't matter what you call them. I just called this pattern one, two, three, four, five. You can call this the green pattern, the red pattern, the blue pattern. You can call it whatever you want. People incorrectly refer to this as the G pattern, the E pattern, the D pattern, the C pattern. They incorrectly do that. Now, the reason that that came to be is because this pattern right here, which I'm calling pattern number one, is because we're in the key of C major here. So if we want to see what shape the C major chord forms in this pattern, you can see that if you look at the notes that make up a C major chord, which are C, E, and G, it forms this shape right here. So this shape right here is known as the G shape. Then if you move up to the next pattern, which I'm assigning the label as pattern number two, two, you will find the C major chord found in this shape. It's just the notes C, E, and G, but they form this shape. This is known as the E shape. Moving to pattern number three, you're going to find a C major chord in this shape. This is called the D shape. Moving up to pattern number four, you have the C major chord in the C shape. Moving up to pattern number five, you have the C major chord in the A shape. So listen, if that is what you've previously been taught, and that's how you've broken up the fretboard in the five bite-sized chunks, you took this one gigantic diatonic scale and you broke it up into five bite-sized chunks, and you think that that's the cage system, then that's fine. That, that allowed you to achieve that goal. The problem is, and I'm going to keep saying this over and over and over and over again, is that you didn't actually learn the cage system. The cage system did not even come into play yet. All you did was you just broke the fretboard down, you broke the diatonic scale into five patterns, and you just assigned five arbitrary labels to those five patterns. The cage system is not going to give you the scale patterns. The cage system is not going to, it's not going to give you the surrounding notes. People are wanting that information. There's no other way around this other than to break things down into the two layers. And this is what I say all the time. Like you have to pay attention to the key that you're playing in. And then you have to pay attention to the actual chords. There's different systems for each of these two layers. Layer one is all about the diatonic scale, the pentatonic scale, breaking the fretboard up into scale patterns and stuff like that. That remains constant. Assuming that the key that you're playing in doesn't change, and you're just playing in one single key the whole time, then the diatonic scale for the key that you're playing in is going to remain constant the entire time. That's a monumental task just to learn how to play in key across the guitar. It's going to take years. But the cage system is not going to is not for that. The cage system doesn't kick in until layer two. Layer two is when you actually want to start paying attention to the chords that you are soloing over. You actually want to start paying attention to the chord changes. That's what the cage system is for. So I have so many lessons about the cage system and the correct way to actually apply the system, but I'm just going to link you to three in particular. One of them is going to be called Stop Overcomplicating the Cage System because everyone overcomplicates that which does not need to be complicated. It's so much easier than what you've been led to believe. So much easier. So watch that video. Number two, it's going to be called Play Any chord anywhere on the entire neck of the guitar. The way that we do that in that video is by using the cage system. And then number three is my super in-depth 45-minute lesson on the cage system that just walks you through the whole thing start to finish. So definitely check out those three videos. They're all completely free. They're all videos on YouTube. Conspiracy theory number three is modes. So the thing about modes is the guitar community just loves to argue about this topic. It's, it's this obsession in the guitar community. It's never going to end. People are just, I don't know, it's been going on since as long as I can remember. Since I first got onto the internet and I first discovered what a guitar forum was where people go on the internet and they talk about guitar stuff, people have been arguing about modes for as long as I can remember. Now, the conspiracy theory here is that this isn't a matter of opinion. Modes just are what they are, and they aren't what they aren't if that makes sense. It's like, it's not up for debate. 
if I point at a tree and I say, that's a tree, I mean, is that up for debate? Not really, you know? So why are we arguing? Why are we arguing over this thing? But there's all these opinions. And the reason it's so prevalent in the guitar community is due to the patterns on the fretboard thing. One of the most common ways to explain modes is labeling patterns on the fretboard. Just as the cage system is incorrectly used as a means to break down this one giant diatonic scale pattern into five individual patterns, which is not what the cage system is for, modes is used to break down this giant diatonic scale pattern into seven patterns. So instead of breaking it up into five patterns and then saying that's the cage system, people sometimes break it up into seven patterns and they're like, oh, well, that's what modes are. But that's not what modes are. Let's go back and we look at the uh, key of C major. You have your C major scale, your seven notes spanned up and down the entire neck of the guitar. We've already broken this down into five patterns, which we can assign arbitrary labels to. Another way to break this down is to break it down into seven patterns. People will often say that this first pattern right here is called the Ionian mode pattern. They'll say that this second pattern is the Dorian mode pattern. Then this is the Phrygian mode pattern, Lydian mode pattern, Mixolydian mode pattern, Aeolian mode pattern, Locrian mode pattern. So when you take that one gigantic diatonic scale pattern that is formed by looking at the seven in key notes for whatever key you're playing in, and then you attempt to break it down into bite-sized chunks, breaking it down into five patterns is very commonly confused with the cage system. Breaking it down into seven patterns is very commonly confused with modes. Breaking it down into just three patterns, which is another way to do it, is never commonly confused with anything. Now, did you ever wonder why you don't usually hear people talking about the three pattern way of breaking up this diatonic scale? Why is that? Because there's nothing to confuse it with. Everyone's so busy confusing the five pattern breakdown way with the cage system, or the seven pattern breakdown way with modes, but no one ever talks about the three pattern way because there's nothing to confuse it with. If there was something to confuse the three pattern way with, you'd probably hear a lot more about the three pattern way. All we did was break up the diatonic scale into smaller bite-sized chunks. Caged is not that, modes is not that, it's just breaking the diatonic scale up into smaller chunks. So I just wanna talk about one more thing pertaining to modes here, and this is the fact that there is so many heated debates on this, and it's absolutely ridiculous. Regarding modes, you have these people that are diehard believers of the relative modes and then diehard believers of the parallel modes. And it's like, no, parallel modes is the only way. Relative is stupid. And then you have these people that are relative mode enthusiasts and they're like, no, relative modes is the only way. Parallel modes is stupid. It's ridiculous because you need to understand both relative and parallel. You need to understand both of them in order to understand what modes are and where they come from. Let me just give you, a, I just want to give you a screenshot of a comment that I got on a video that I made about relative modes. As you can see from that comment, that was a very, very angry man. Now that angry man, he is a very, very strong enthusiast of parallel modes. And parallel modes are great. You should understand them. You absolutely should. And that's exactly why I made my next video right after that video. And it was about parallel modes. You need to understand both. You need to understand relative and parallel. Let me give you a very, very quick example, and then we're going to kind of uh, end this video here. So let's say that the goal is to play in D Dorian. That's my goal. There's a rhythm section over there. They're playing a, a D Dorian jam. They told me that it's the D Dorian jam. I'm like, okay, D Dorian jam. My goal is to play in D Dorian. How do I do that? I have two ways that I can go about thinking about this. I can either take the relative approach or I can take the parallel approach, both of which are going to lead me to the same end goal. So my goal is to play in D Dorian. Taking the relative approach, I could think to myself, okay, D Dorian, the D Dorian scale shares the same notes as the C major scale. Cool. Got it. So I just have to map out the seven notes of the C major scale across the entire neck of the guitar, and that's going to give me my framework for playing in D Dorian. I just want to kind of maintain awareness of where the D note is at all points on the guitar because that's the tonic, that's the tonal center. Because I'm playing in D Dorian, I want to have an awareness of where each instance of the note D is at all spots of the guitar. But all of the other remaining notes are just the same notes as the C major scale. So that's the relative approach. I can also arrive at that same exact goal by taking the parallel thought approach. I can say, okay, my goal is to play in D Dorian. How do I get there? Okay, well, 
I take the D major scale to start with. The D major scale has a formula of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 because that's the major scale formula. The major scale is the one and only default scale for which all other scale formulas are compared to. So if I write out my D major scale and assign numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and then I look at the Dorian scale formula, which is 1, 2, flat 3, 4, 5, 6, flat 7, and then I apply what the Dorian scale formula says to do, which is to take the third and seventh note and flatten them by one half step, the end result is the D Dorian scale. So both thought approaches led to the exact same end goal. I ended up with the notes of the D Dorian scale, which is exactly what I was trying to do. Regardless of whether I got there by thinking, hey, that's the same key as C major, it's the same seven notes, therefore the same fretboard patterns as C major, or if I think that's the D major scale with a flattened third and seventh interval, it doesn't matter which way I choose to think about it, I get to the same end goal either way. That's why relative and parallel modes are both important to understand, and that is why in my three-part series, part one is about relative modes, part two is about parallel modes, and then part three is about how to actually use modes in your playing. So why all the arguing? Why is everyone arguing with each other? Why does this? Why is this the biggest debate in all of the whole guitar community? So anyway, I'm going to end this video here. I said what I had to say about those three points. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Mm -hmm.